I'm glad. Apparently Dylan's the only one in here. <laughs> we have things to be thankful for, do we not? Yeah. We have blessings to thank him for. I, I got it right here. You bow with me, please, and we'll pray as we get started. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day that you have given us and the privilege that we have to count our blessings because of who you are and, Lord, because of what you do. <coughs> you are a good, great, gracious, wonderful, holy Father, now as we transition over into the proclamation of your word, speak as only you can in the very depths of our being. Father, help us to take this word, allow you to apply it to the doorposts of our hearts. Father, help us to live our lives that we might be pleasing in your sight and make a difference in this world for your wonderful kingdom. Have your will and way, and we'll thank you in advance for what you're about to do, for we ask it in the blessed name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Politicians have long understood <coughs> that the best way to get people on their side is to give them what they want. You want their vote and promise that you're going to give them what they want and normally, in a lot of instances, they will be a, uh, they'll pledge their allegiance to you and they will follow you and they will do as you have asked them to do because you give them what they want. I'm going to tell you something. Before politicians came along, our adversary, the devil, knew that quite well. And during the time of the Great Tribulation period, he will put that even more so into practice. Because the Bible teaches that his, I'll call it his staff member as it were, the, the person that is known in the Word of God as the Antichrist, is going to promise the world peace in the midst of turmoil. And the Bible teaches us that he will deliver that for a short period of time. But just as the world begins to, to hail him as their universal hero, the rest of his wicked plan will unfold. And people will see him as who he really is. Now I want you to think with me for just a moment. When you look around at the things that are going on today, have you ever given the thought or have you ever expressed the thought what in the world is going on in the world during the time in which we are living? You know, I, I was one that thought based on what our president and our state department had told us I thought that the war on terrorism was supposed to be over. That's what we were told. We were, we were pulled out of this place and that place and the other place and told basically we don't have anything else to worry about. But a couple of months, three, four months ago, a new crisis <coughs> arose. A terrorist army by the name of ISIS came into being. And the truth of the matter is we have never faced out of all the threats that the United States of America has faced, we have never faced a terrorist army before. And now we have all these random acts of violence uh, from these Islamic terrorists going on across the United States and in different places around the world. Just this past week, the surviving brother of the Boston Marathon bombing that took place 
was sentenced and found guilty and will be sentenced sometime within the next week or so. It happened right here on our home soil. And I've said it to you before, but I'm going to say it to you again today, and you better take this down and believe this. If we do not face the situation and the problem over there, <coughs> one of these days we're going to have to face the situation and the problem over here. Amen. 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 Because you hear me correctly today, it is not going away. Amen. And the right way to handle this is not by burying one's head in the sand and hoping at some point in time that it's simply going to disappear. My dear friend, these are scary times in which we live. But you know, it's not like this all snuck up on our ward without his being aware of the situation. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, beginning with verse 25, the Lord Jesus tells us, and I quote, In the last days, there will be distress of nations with no way out. I didn't say that. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said it. There will be distress of nations with no way out. <coughs> Make no mistake about what I'm talking to you about today. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Amen. There is a recently released poll that came out within the last couple of months that was taken of a cross section of America and did you know that most Americans believe today that our country is in trouble and in many instances is out of control not our world but our nation, the United States of America 64% of Americans who were polled believe that America is out of control at this very moment in time 64%. Matter of fact, I just thought of this. Pam gave me during Sunday school the very latest copy of the biblical recorder that is put out by the Southern Baptist Convention. <coughs> and I was thumbing through it while you were in Sunday school. And let me see if I can put my finger on this thing right quick there was something that jumped out at me. Yeah, right here. A survey done among Americans concerning church. Now, there was two surveys, one about church attendance and then one about church in general. It doesn't, it doesn't say here how many people were polled, but here's what it, I guess it does. A thousand Americans. A thousand Americans were polled <clears throat> And they were asked to finish this sentence. In America, the church is... And they were given several options. In America, the church is... 55% of Americans said the church is declining. Okay? 55% says that the church is declining. 42% say that the church is dying. And 11% say that church attendance is useless. That's here. <coughs> now, today, in America, where 11%, one out of 10 basically, says that church attendance makes absolutely no sense one way or the other and has no bearing on one's life. And 55% say that church is declining today. In other words, it's not as strong today as it was back whenever in our past. And 42% say the church is dying. 
And you know what? Many of them are. Many of them are. Many of them are not relevant anymore. Many of them don't make any kind of a difference anymore. Many of them don't care anymore that they don't make a difference. It's terrible. It's sad. It's sad to see so many empty pews in this place today. It's sad. I heard my brother pray a while ago during the Sunday school assembly. Don't, don't remember the exact words, but it was he prayed for those that basically are not here and they don't care that they're not here. Doesn't matter. We're in scary times. We're in sad times. And many people believe today that America, our beloved nation, is out of control. So that's why I felt that it was imperative <clears throat> to tackle the subject of Antichrist, Armageddon, and America. Here's where I want us to start. <clears throat> Try, if you can, to picture a world without the United States of America. If America could just be simply taken off of the globe today and there was no America anymore, how would things be different in the remainder of the world if the United States simply did not exist? Or if the United States had existed but now no longer exists? Questions like this. What if George Washington had been killed during battle and the United States had lost the American Revolution? What if the United States and the other free nations of the world had been defeated in World War I or World War II? What if Hitler had actually really risen to power? I want to look at it another way. If the United States was, was not a part of the world, who would have stopped Hitler? Who would have stood up to the aggression of the Soviet Union? Who would have led the charge against global terrorism after the carnage of 9-11? Who would step into the gap and provide humanitarian aid to the rest of the world that is always expected of the United States if there was no United States? How would the rest of the world fare if we were no longer a nation? What would happen or what will happen if this world collapses under its own weight of debt or debauchery, what would the rest of the world look like without the United States of America? Why do I ask this? Hear me very carefully. Why do I ask? Because there is coming a day when America will no longer be a reigning superpower as she is today and as she has been for many, many years. <clears throat> there is coming a day when America will no longer be the force in the world that she is at this present time. As a matter of fact, if you go back and study the end time events within the Word of God, you'll find that there is no mention of America at all. You can find Israel. You can find Iran. You can arguably find Russia and China. 
But there's no mention made anywhere about the United States in end time events. So the question has to be, or the question must be raised, where are we? And why are we not mentioned? And we'll be looking into that within the coming weeks, but we need to take first things first. So let me make one thing absolutely clear. I'm going to take this as it comes. Antichrist, Armageddon, America. So I want you to pay particular attention to what I'm about to tell you. There is coming upon the world scene a leader who one day will make Hitler and Stalin and Bin Laden look like choir boys in comparison to who he is and what he will do. And the scary thing is the Bible tells us that the world will pledge their allegiance to this one whom the Bible calls the Antichrist. He's going to be sent by Satan but when you get right down to it, you ought not be surprised because of all the things that Satan is. Basically, when you get right down to brass tacks, Satan is an imitator of God. An imitator of God. As a matter of fact, the first sin in the Bible I give you the scripture reference. You can go back and look at it later. The first sin in the Bible did not happen in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. The first sin in the Bible happened not in the Garden of Eden, but it happened in heaven and is recorded in Isaiah chapter 14 when Satan said, I'm going to take the place of God. I'm going to rule and reign. I will be like God. And the Bible says that Satan and a third of the angels in heaven were cast out. So it didn't start in Eden. It started in heaven. When Satan sought to overthrow or to take the place of Almighty God. So he is an imitator of God and the things of God. Now you know this as well as I do. Not, good, not just concerning Satan, but concerning anything. <coughs> Whenever and wherever you find that which is genuine, you will also find that which is fake. Or phony. <coughs> let me let you in on a little something that you need to know. If you ever run up on a uh, advertisement for Oakley sunglasses for twenty-five dollars a piece, you probably need to know there's a good possibility those are not real. If you ladies ever run up on a Coach pocketbook. For 20 bucks. More than likely, it's not real. It's fake. It's fake. But anytime you have the real thing, you'll also have the copy, or the counterfeit, or the fake, or the phony. It's not only true about material things. It's true about people. It's true about people. Whenever you find real Christians, you'll also find fake Christians. <coughs> okay? People whose talk is one thing and their walk is something all the Amen. Amen, Amen, brother. And I don't have to have a show of hands. <coughs> But I believe if I ask for a show of hands, everybody in here, if I said, how many of you know at least one person like that? <coughs> Every hand in here would be good. 
We all know them. They claim to be one thing, <coughs> but they're not. They are an imitator. They're fake. They're a phony. They are a fraud. They're not real. <coughs> Anytime you find a true man of God who will stand in the pulpit of God and preach without apology and without compromise the word of God to the people of God, you also find fake men of God who will preach anything and everything that people want to hear because they want to be right and they want to be, have a job and they want to have some prestige or they want to have some power and so they'll do whatever they need to to whoever they need to in order to have that following. Amen. Listen to me. I can completely change what I preach and how I preach and the way I preach. And I can preach every Sunday a message that basically pats everybody on the back or pats everybody on the head. Hopefully I didn't ruffle that one. Pats everybody on the head or whatever and says, and hey, you're all right. Don't worry about things. You do whatever you want to, however you want to, say whatever you want to, go wherever you want to, be with whomever you want to, act in any way you want to. Everything's fine. God's heart's broad. Everybody's accepted. There are many ways to heaven. And you know what? We have more people in here than I know what to do with. Amen. Amen. We'd be talking right now about we're going to have to build a new sanctuary because people are coming from everywhere. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing when you don't preach the truth, you can gather a big following. But when you stay with the Word of God, people fall away. But you know what? I'm not the first preacher who ever had that problem. Jesus Himself did. Amen. You go back and stay the Word of God and you'll see where Jesus the Bible talks about he preached some hard truths or some hard sayings and a number of people fell away. Amen. And the Bible says, and walked with him no more. Okay? I'm going to tell you something. I don't say this for applause. If you want to applaud, that'd be fine. <coughs> but I'm not saying this for applause. I'm saying it because it's the truth. And I say it whether there's 50 people in here or whether there be 50,000 people in here. I will not compromise on preaching the Word of God. And I will tell it the way God intends for it to be told. And the shoe can fit whomever's foot it needs to fit, even if it's my own foot. And many times, I've had to wear the shoes a week or two or three or a month before you ever got a chance to try them on. Because God has already dealt with me in my study. He may deal with you when I'm in, my, in the pulpit, but He deals with me when I'm in my study. But I will never, ever, 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 never compromise on the Word of the living God. Amen. Great job, brother. <clears throat> Some of you saw an article that I posted on Facebook this week about Joel Osteen. <coughs> Joel Osteen has the largest church in the United States. <coughs> he also has one of the most liberal and loose theologies of any preacher in the United States, too. Okay? You need to be careful of those who are always smiling. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you something <clears throat> listen I've said it before and Joel if you're watching hello I've said it before you listen to me if you're going to preach the whole counsel of God it's like the old Clint Eastwood movie sometimes it's the good sometimes it's the bad and sometimes it's the ugly sometimes we've just got to call sin sin and we've got to stand on the Word of God. Listen, if you can't stand on the Word, you don't have anything to stand on. Amen. Amen. Nothing. 
So wherever you have real men of God, you're going to have false men of God too. So the Bible teaches us that in the last days, Satan will have his counterfeit version of Jesus Christ. Now, understand some things here. This man will bring some sense of calm to the global chaos that will be going on in the world. The Bible says that he'll bring war to an end. The Bible says he's going to bring economic prosperity. And a lot of people will say, man, that's good. I mean, it, it, when you look at just those things, I'd like to see war come to an end, wouldn't you? Amen. I'd like to see economic prosperity, especially in mine and Debbie's paycheck. <laughs> Y'all need to be praying for us. We went and got our taxes done this week. <laughs> when I got when I left H and R Block, there's blood all over the floor, and it wasn't hers; it was mine. It wasn't the tax preparers, it was mine. <laughs> How can you make so little and still have to pay so much? <laughs> but anyway, that's a sermon for another day, so I'll just leave that where it is. May I take up a love offering? <laughs> but I want you to understand that in reality, the one called the Antichrist will be Satan's master puppet. It will look as though he is the one who is in control, but make no mistake about it, Satan is behind the scenes pulling the strings. Because it's not the Antichrist who will be in control. It will be none other than Satan himself. This man will be the tool in the hands of our enemy, <coughs> causing many people to be deceived and to go astray. But hear me carefully. When he comes, when he comes because he will be a deceiver, when he comes, he's not going to be dressed from head to toe in black with red eyes, and he's not going to speak like Darth Vader. Okay? You ever turned the fan on and spoken into the fan? No, I am your father. You ever done that? If you haven't, you need to do that. Every one of you. Every one of you will sound like Darth Vader. But that's not, thank you, that's not the way he's going to be. Because if that were the case, he wouldn't be a deceiver. We'd say, well, wait a minute. Something wrong here. Right? We'd say, no, that, that's not true. But that's not how he's coming. I truly think that he, when he comes, he'll be attractive. He'll be charismatic. He'll be highly intelligent. He'll be suave. He'll be impressive. He'll be the greatest peacemaker this world has ever known. No doubt when he comes, if these entities are still alive and, 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 and well at that particular time, no doubt he'll be on the cover of GQ magazine. No doubt he'll be voted in as Time's Man of the Year. No doubt that at some point in time he'll be voted upon as receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. Don't be mistaken. He'll be the satanic Superman. He'll even get the Jews and the Arab nations to sign a peace treaty that they're actually going to abide by for a short period of time. But the truth is, he's going to be the most evil, the most diabolical man who has ever set foot upon planet Earth. So why should we give so much attention to this one individual? Because there's a hundred passages in the Word of God that teach in detail concerning the origin, the nationality, the career, the character, the kingdom, and the final doom of this one who is called the Antichrist. He's discussed at great length in the book of Daniel, in 2 Thessalonians, and also in the book of Revelation. The sheer volume of information that is available about him in the Word of God should cause us to want to know who he is and what he will do. 
But here's a quick synopsis. If you learn anything about Bible prophecy, or if you know anything about Bible prophecy, to bring it all down to just a quick snapshot, here's what you need to understand. For the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the end, we win. Amen. Hallelujah. In the end, we will be victorious. Satan's going to have a few victories, so to speak. But in the end, Christ prevails. He returns to rule and to reign in righteousness. But before that time comes, there will be a time of great wickedness and great suffering upon the planet Earth. So with all those things in mind, I want you to look very quickly at Revelation 13. Beginning with verse 1. I won't ask you to stand, but look at chapter 13, <coughs> beginning with the first verse. And as you're looking there, let me remind you now that much of this is symbolic language in order to help us to see and understand the truth of what really will be going on. Chapter 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, <coughs> And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his ten horns crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue, or that actually means to make war, for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell upon the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now please understand the phrase there or the word horns that's mentioned. The word horns is symbolic for power. And the word dragon there is a term used to point out Satan. He's called the great dragon in many places within the word of God. So here's how it all falls out. Satan will give power to the Antichrist who will be the coming world leader. Okay? Satan will give him his power. As a matter of fact, it says in verse 4, they worship the dragon who gave authority or gave power to the beast. You need to understand something. You may know this, you may not. But this power that Satan gives or will give to the Antichrist is the devil's to give. Remember when Jesus went into the wilderness right after his baptism and was confronted and tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights? In the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 verse 6, Satan speaks to Jesus. You remember he took him, he, he tempted him in three different areas or in three different ways. And in Luke chapter 4 beginning with verse 6, Satan says this to Jesus and I quote, listen very carefully. All this authority, this is Satan speaking now, 
All this authority I will give you and their glory. For it has been delivered to me. And I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. <clears throat> Satan tells Jesus, all this authority has been given to me. And if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you. Now you go back and study anywhere and everywhere it talks about the temptation of Jesus. And when Satan speaks to him, and you'll know what you find. You'll find that nowhere in there does Jesus ever dispute what Satan has said to him. Satan doesn't say, hey, I've got the authority. And Jesus says, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. No, there's no argument. Satan says, I've been given the authority and I have the authority to give it to you. Jesus doesn't say anything. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Satan is called the God of this age, little g, God. And the prince of the power of the air. So Satan has this power to give. He tried to give it fully. He tried to give it originally to the Lord Jesus Christ, but he couldn't find a taker. Ultimately, however, he will find a taker in this one called the Antichrist. And that authority that he was going to give Jesus he will give to this counterfeit. The term beast that is used here does not describe his looks. I told you a while ago, I think he's going to be attractive, intelligent, good looking on the cover of GQ, you know, Gentleman's Quarterly Magazine because he's going to be one of these and everybody's going to go, oh. The term beast does not <coughs> is not dealing with his looks. It doesn't describe his looks, it describes his character. For you see, the word antichrist not only means against, anti mean anti is a negative. It means to be against Christ. But it also goes farther than that. It not only means to be against Christ. But it also means to be instead of Christ. <coughs> he will be in the place at that day as a world leader instead of Christ. While he'll also still be living and ruling in opposition or against Christ. So this will be Satan's masterpiece. This is his crowning achievement. His crowning counterfeit a forged and false replica of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who he is. So let's look just real briefly at what he does. What's his agenda? What will be the agenda of this one called the Antichrist? Briefly, there's four things. You may want to scribble these down. Four things that will be his agenda. Number one, the Antichrist is coming to defy... No, excuse me. The Antichrist is coming to deify Satan. The Antichrist is coming to deify or to make like God Satan. Look at chapter 13, verse 4. So they worship the dragon. Who's that? Satan. So they worship Satan who gave authority to the beast, that is to the Antichrist, and they worship the beast, the Antichrist, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him. The Antichrist comes to deify Satan. When he comes, and in the way he comes, and by what he does, 
all the world who does not know Christ will begin to worship Satan. And that is exactly what he's always wanted to be worshipped. Number two, the Antichrist is coming to defy and take the place of Jesus. <clears throat> to defy and take the place of Jesus. Look at chapter 13, verse 5. And he was given a name speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. <clears throat> three and a half years. He will be opposing Jesus and will be offering himself in the place of Jesus. A copy. A counterfeit. What looks like the real thing, going back to what we talked about earlier, but which will prove to be a fake, a phony, and a fraud. Number three. The Antichrist is coming to kill Christians. Yep, I said it. The Antichrist is coming to kill Christians. Look at verse 7, chapter 13. <clears throat> it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now hear me carefully. I do not believe, I think the Bible teaches, and I agree with this, I do not believe that the Antichrist can nor will be revealed upon this earth until the Holy Spirit has taken the church away from the earth in what is called the rapture. I believe that because the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning with verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, and he is in capital, or begins with a capital H. He who now restrains, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit, <coughs> will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. <laughs> the restraining force in the world right now that is keeping things on somewhat of an even keel and not allowing all hell to break loose. That restraining force is the followers of Christ who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. <coughs> the only reason this world today is not any worse off than it already is is because, listen, you and I are still here. Amen. Yes, amen. Okay. Because you and I are still here. When we are gone, when the Lord Jesus Christ completes the bride, the church is the bride, and He's adding unto the bride daily all over this world. And when it gets to the point that the bride is complete, the bridegroom, whom is the Lord Jesus Christ, will say to his bride, Come up hither. Come up here. And we in an instant will be gone. The Bible says, In a twinkling of an eye, at the trump of God, the dead will be raised, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the cloud. Twinkling with eye. You know how you know how fast the eye twinkles? A study was done some 25, 30 years ago at the University of Texas. And they estimated, I don't know how they do this, but they estimated that the eye twinkled 42 times a second. Okay? So you couldn't even say, there it comes. It already happened. You know, we can't go. No, we'll be gone. It'd be just like, even quicker than that. 
and it'll be over. And once we're gone, once we've left, <coughs> he has the opportunity to come and do his thing. Because a little bit more to be here. The third thing I told you was he's coming to kill Christians. Listen. Those who know Christ, I'm almost through. Those who know Christ as Savior and Lord, who were alive when the rapture occurs, will be taken out of here. Quicker than that, okay? So let's just assume for the moment that it happens right now and we're gone. Okay? All of those who are, and you've heard the term before, left behind will have to go through a seven year period called the tribulation. Now I don't have the time to go into all of that today, but just follow me. I need to make this brief. A seven year period called the tribulation. There will be those upon this earth who will come to know Christ as the Savior and Lord of their life during the tribulation period. And it is those people who will be saved during that time, many of whom will die at the hands of the Antichrist. And I say that to say this. You can look around the world today and see the foreshadowing of that even in the world as we live today. Every day you see, you read, you hear, you watch on television where people around this world are dying for their faith in Christ. Every single day. Will it ever happen here? Yeah, but will we be here? I'm not sure. I don't know whether we'll be persecuted here before Christ takes us away or not. But we can already see this thing of killing Christians. It's already happening. The Antichrist hasn't been revealed, but the fact that Christians are dying for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is happening even today. Number four. <coughs> Last one. The Antichrist is coming to dominate the world. The Antichrist is coming to dominate the world. Look very quickly at verse number eight. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation. Every person who is not a Christian will bow at the feet of the one who is called the Antichrist. In the Old Testament book of Daniel chapter 8 verse 25 the Bible says through peace he will destroy many. Through peace he will destroy many. <coughs> I've already said this. Let me just reiterate as I close. This coming world leader will come during the economically difficult times upon planet Earth. And he will solidify the world's economic system and will bring peace to the world. So understand something. Listen. Understand something. The tribulation will not start violently. It will start peacefully. It will end violently. But it will not start that way. They'll think that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they'll bow and they'll give them they'll give him their hearts, their lives, their fortune their obedience and his number will be either stamped upon their hand or upon their forehead. Now, we'll continue with more of this the next time we're together. But let's step away for just a second concerning who he is and what he looks like. <coughs> Let me conclude today by asking you a question. Let me conclude today by asking you a question. Are you anti-Christ? Are you anti-Christ?
Antichrist. Now, before you blow up at me, I'm not asking you if you are the Antichrist because I know you're not. I'm asking you, are you Antichrist? 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 begins this way. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. In other words, they are already here. By which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out from us that it might be made manifest. In other words, it might be made known or it might be revealed that none of them were of us. So here's how I want to conclude. I want to ask you a question. Are you anti-Christ? We were talking a while ago about people who say one thing and do something totally different. Who proclaim to be one thing here and yet are totally something completely opposite there. Okay? You can fool me. <clears throat> you can fool this church. You can fool your spouse. You can fool your children. You can fool your grandkids. You can fool your girlfriend. You can fool your boyfriend. But there's two people that you're not going to ever fool. I've said this before. One of them occupies your seat. Okay? Because while I may not know, you know. So one of them occupies your seat and the other one occupies the throne of glory. And he knows. Okay? So you're not going to fool yourself and you're not going to fool him. I'm asking you today, do you know Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of your life? If not, if not, make no mistake. Should you be here when the rapture occurs, you will be left behind. Do you understand what I'm telling you? If you are not a true child of God and the rapture were to take place while I'm talking, you don't look around and say, where did everybody go? And you may be the only one left.
measure his way in your heart and life. And 275, let's stand together as we sing this altar is open. You need to come.